Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Richard. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, Lippy. Thank you so much. How are you? Doing well. It's been one of those weeks. Just so much happening. Um, a lot of news breaking also, but uh, excited. Excited about some of the stories that we're going to cover. I'm excited to be talking to you again. Um, how was your week? Um, what's, what's new? Uh, my week was also busy, but in a good way. Lots of interesting, fun conversations and breakthroughs. Uh, you and I have been working on a retreat for yeah. leaders uh, that's focused. There's going to be two tracks. One is going to be creative leaders. One is going to be focused specifically on AI. We are working with our customers, our clients to organize that. So that's been taking up a little bit of my time. Um, but yeah, uh, that's exciting overall, though. I'm, interesting I'm really week. looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fun. Um, we'll, we'll obviously be releasing more as the, the details emerge, but uh, suffice to say, these will be most likely based in Europe mm -hmm. to begin with. And then we'll probably have some uh, domestic US events as well. Um, and that's uh, mostly because we want these experiences to be memorable and exciting and um, the physical location to be actually a, a kind of a, a mindset change for people. So uh, one of the things I've learned over the years running workshops and, and retreats is that when you take people out of their familiarity, out of their normal environments and put them into something special, something interesting, something a little adventurous, their minds open up as well. So mood follows action is how I like to describe this. So we change the action, we change the environment and the mood follows. I love that. Uh, so yes, definitely look out for more details on our upcoming um, executive retreats and events. It's going to be a fantastic time. All right, so let's yeah. dive into this week's stop stories. Um, there are a couple that I wanted mm -hmm. to highlight and um, a couple of things I, I think I definitely want to have a conversation around. So this mm -hmm. week, if I'm just bringing up imaginative.com, um, we had a bunch of stories around uh, image AI models. And uh, mm -hmm. earlier this morning, you shared some images that were generated <laughs> with AI of you that were fine tuned mm -hmm. and you were able to show yourself in all of these different scenarios. Can you walk the audience through how you did it? I'm going to put them up so that they can just see how realistic these images are from different um, time periods in different locations. They look fantastic. It's a lot of fun, but yeah, how, yeah. what was that workflow like for you? So I think uh, a little bit of context here. So up until now, we've seen image generation for generative AI essentially be composites of things that it's been trained on. So the way that these models work is that uh, they are fed or trained on um, images that represent certain things. So let's say you're trying to create an image of an elephant or a tree it takes all of those images that it's been trained on and it produces what it thinks is uh, the, the right response for your prompt. Mm -hmm. So if you set a tree of a certain size, a certain color or whatever, it would do its best to use its trained material to produce that. Um, and that really is an insight into how, how these models really work because you know, they are as smart as the information that they're being provided. Yeah. Uh, these newer models are slightly different. What they're doing is they're essentially training on the fly. They're using some information that they've been trained on. So in the case of these images that you're going to see Chris post on, on this video, uh, these are images that are being informed by, say, uh, period posts or period images um, that you know, represent maybe this, the 20s or the 30s or you know the, the 1500s or something like that. So these models are using that as almost like their background uh, data, but then they're using images that you're uploading of yourself or somebody in your family, maybe or some of your friend, and they're recreating that image with your specific <laughs> tuned portrait inside that, that image. So pretty cool. As you can see, as you can see from these images, they're, they're highly, highly tuned. They're very accurate. They, um, you can add as many images of yourself as you need to train the model. And obviously the, the more accurate and more um, high fidelity those images are, the more likely you are going to get a good response. So this particular app that I was using, this is both a web and an Apple app. It's called Rimini, R-E-M-I-N-I. -I. And um, it's 99 cents for the first three days. And then you also have to pay beyond that per month. Um, I'm going to just test it out for the next three days, see see what I like, see what I want to keep it. It's a lot of fun. 
the thing that struck me most, um, just from a personal point of view, is how much I looked like my father when I generated images from oh. the forties and fifties and sixties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, actually looked a lot like the photographs that his black and white photographs that he has in his albums. So I think that's kind of that's cool. Um, also, maybe on a more kind of uh, you know heartfelt note, is that uh, some of you who've been listening to this know that I lost my wife a couple of years ago to cancer. And it would actually be really interesting to generate new images of her or new videos of her for my son uh, and the other kids that, that are part of our family. Um, my, you know, uh, her, would, would her stepchildren, <laughs> my sons, uh, they would be able to see her in you know these kind of aged versions that it's yeah. able to produce. So it's able to actually show the image at different ages. You know, what would you look like in your 50s and your 60s? So really... Um, not not particularly new. We've seen some images like this, but mm -hmm. a lot of these images have been things that are not necessarily at the fingertips of the average consumer. We've seen the, the kind of the bigger um, models demonstrate this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? We've seen this on a lot of the the kind of the presentations that the the models have been showing what's possible. But now we're actually seeing it in apps. We're actually seeing it in your consumer apps that you can just download on your phone. Yeah, I love that. And uh, how complicated was it from a workflow standpoint for you to create these images? How long did it take to train the, the model? It was incredibly easy. Um, the UI and the UX uh, was far, far superior than what I've seen in some of the other recent apps. Um, you just uh, upload, I think uh, you can start with a minimum of four images. So really, really simple. You just I, you just opened up my, my, my gallery from my own photo selection just uploaded them and it, within I think about 20 seconds it was able to generate the first images wow. so also this time was was uh, impressive I've I've used some of these apps before um, never been able to create anything with this kind of fidelity though yeah impressive so I'll, I'll give some background as to what happened in the last two and a half weeks and how we got here because it has incredible repercussions for the industry and there are some other yeah. stories that are tangentially related to this so right. there's, there's some shadow stuff <laughs> going on as well sometimes <laughs> so 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 here's here's the thing a couple weeks ago this company called black forest labs released flux mm -hmm. one it was a brand new state-of-the-art open source image generating model and up until now the state-of-the-art was stable diffusion most of the tools that you are seeing, most of the consumer apps were using Stable Diffusion. Um, it was great, but it, it wasn't able to necessarily compete with the mid journeys of the world in terms of realism. Now, when Flux One came out two weeks ago, it wasn't better than mid journey by any means. It was an average model, but it was an open source model. And so mm -hmm. the community all started working on this new model and they decided to fine tune it with things like Realism Laurel. And within two weeks, it was able to surpass, arguably, the state of the art, which was Mid Journey 6.1. And that is a big deal, because this now means that you can run this model on your computer to create images, to fine tune it with mm -hmm. your content, and also um, to have the privacy that you'd want. But here's mm -hmm. the catch. We have always stressed that the technology is not a product. And what you saw with Stable Diffusion, they were hot for a while. They were very popular. But it was also a challenge for them to monetize um, their model and to create a business model around their open source technologies. And so here, you're seeing someone take Flux and say, hey, you know what? We're going to build an actual product around this. And to your point, the user experience, the app, the interface, that's what makes the difference because nobody cares about the underlying technology. What they care about is that experience that they're, they're getting. And so, yes, behind the scenes, you have this powerful new model, um, but Remini or Remini um, must be commended for one, so quickly building a consumer product that people are excited about and that they're getting behind. But they're not the only ones that um, are paying attention. This week, Elon Musk X.AI released Grok2. And the big surprise in Grok2 was that they decided to just integrate Flux1 directly into their model. Rather than trying to build their own image generation mm -hmm. model, they looked at it and they're like, you know what? This is really great. 
um, we're just going to use this technology. And of course, there are lots of questions that we'll need to ask because they didn't have any guardrails in their model compared to like a Midjourney or a Dali 3 mm -hmm. um, or a, a Gemini where you can't have certain prompts. And so this week, social media started to get flooded with pictures of political figures or celebrities, um, just like you're saying, Richard, that you can fine tune <laughs> on um, different pictures and then put them in different scenarios. And so there, there are questions about responsibility, um, about uh, oversight with these models that we'll, we'll want to just have a conversation around. And then the, the last thing I'll touch on, you'll see another story on Imaginative that this week, Google also released Imagen 3, which is the third generation of right. their image model. And they didn't Amazing. even make an announcement about it. They just kind of um, slid it under the radar. And I, I think it's because when you look at the quality of what you're getting with a Flux One compared to now a, a product that is a paid product from um, one of the largest tech companies in the world, and you see mm -hmm. that the open source model is better, there are questions that start to be raised, right? And so I, I think you're seeing the repercussions of what open source will mean for the industry as a whole. Um, you're starting to see the difference between people that are going to be good at creating products that users mm -hmm. actually want versus just building a technology. And you're also mm -hmm. starting to see questions around ethics and oversight, especially when it comes to releasing technologies like Flux in the wild that don't have digital signatures that tell you that it was AI generated. And so for somebody right. just looking on, they wouldn't be able to know that, oh, this um, has been generated by an AI model. So lots to discuss, dive in, tell me what yeah, you think. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so many layers. Obviously the first layer here, of course, is just that the technology is improving. Mm -hmm. You know, we, nothing surprising there, we're expecting these improvements. Second layer, of course, is how it's being used. We talked to this, about this a lot last week, just yeah. because the technology is there. It's not always obvious how it will be used. And of course, like whether there's a business model associated with it. So we're starting to just see uh, the first consumer products that actually have a business model built into them. We don't know whether those are going to be successful or not, mm -hmm. but at least we're starting to see these experiments. The third layer, of course, is the consequences. What are the second and third order effects of actually creating these things? Yes. Uh, San Francisco and California as a whole are being very, very aggressive in terms of regulating. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, regulation uh, being... Uh, directed or lawsuits being directed directly at websites mm -hmm. for posting these images. Um, not just the fact that the images weren't uh, tagged as um, as AI generated, but more specifically, without the consent of the person whose image is portraying. So this is um, <clears throat> this is a really important. This is going back to our conversation about censorship, about IP, about yep. the whole you know um, you know. Scarlett Johansson drama at Meta, like, I mean, there are just so many reasons for regulators and for lawyers. And in this case, the city, the city of San Francisco specifically, to get very, very aggressive yeah. about this new technology. I kind of like this. I, I think there's probably people, there's a, probably, you know, um, a lot of, you know, libertarian minded folks who would prefer this to be a self-regulating market. But what we need to see here is the pendulum swing from where we were in, so in social media, where there was literally no action taken mm -hmm. until it was too late. And then we had, you know, TikTok had to actually find itself in front of a Senate hearing. Yeah. Um, now we're actually seeing local governments, uh, state governments say, this is not cool. You can't do this. We, we, we understand that there are consequences for both the creators and for the people who are creating these images about. Um, <clears throat> but it's an election year. So it is. Uh, let's talk about that. You saw uh, Iranian hackers getting in on the action. This is a, a, maybe not that surprising, but um, talk, let's talk a little bit about that. You, you know, this being such a kind of a busy political period, let's talk a little bit about how, that's, uh, how these image creators, these video creators are affecting uh, the, the narrative and, and just the general you know, storytelling that's going on. So that's a very good point. You have a couple things that are happening around the elections, around deep fakes, around uh, disinformation and misinformation. This is not new. We've seen mm -hmm. campaigns like this basically every election for most modern elections. 
what is yes. new is how quickly you're able to create um, content today and the reach that you're going to get with social media and mm -hmm. the realism that you get in terms of the content that's being created. And that trifecta is disastrous for a lot of mm -hmm. um, different reasons. And so opening, I released a report this week and it, it follows a report last week by Microsoft. And if you go to the website, you'll see uh, the article has a link to the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Report. And last week, yeah. Microsoft had outlined a bunch of different actors that they had identified that were looking to influence political discourse within the US mm -hmm. across different topics, across the um, Israel-Gaza war, across South American poli politics, across the, the upcoming elections. And uh, OpenAI, because of that report, was able to start going through their system and identify and flag use cases where Iranians were using ChatGPT to create website content, to create social media posts, um, to yeah. create content that would sow division, that would spark controversy, and obviously to, to hopefully shift the conversation in the direction that they want. This is a big problem, especially for a population that isn't very AI literate right now. And I, I think right. that goes back to just our core um, philosophy in terms of why imaginative needs to exist to drive AI literacy within individuals, within um, businesses, within society as a whole. Because there are so many times that I get conversations being forwarded to me and people have no idea that it's AI generated and it's not real because right. who is going to check the source, right? You see a website um, that looks pretty real, um, the images mm -hmm. look pretty believable, you're hearing a voice that sounds like the person, um, who is going to actually check the source? And so we, we need to have a much broader conversation around maybe the security um, norms that we need to have in place, new measures in terms of how we identify real content. And of course, we, we have discussed technologies that are in the works, but we also need to talk about regulation because this is only going to get worse. We stress the technology that you see today is the worst that it's going to be. And we're seeing yeah. it at a level yeah. now where we have right. crossed so that kind of valley. <laughs> we, we have gone down the valley and we're going up a new mountain that we haven't been before. And so right. you, you saw this week also that in California, they uh, are bringing their AI bill to a vote. And so it's nice mm -hmm. because it comes right on the heels of this um, disinformation campaign that uh, OpenAI was able to identify with Iran. But you're seeing yeah. again where California is saying, you know what, we're going to be strict in terms of uh, what we think regulation should look like. Of course, mm -hmm. the, the, the industry is very divided on this bill. I can't stress that enough. There, there seems to be yeah. a big um, segment that are thinking this is overreach. It's too much regulation too early. Um, but others that are saying they disagree with it because they believe regulation should happen at the federal level because they don't want to have to deal with right. regulation at, at each individual state level. And uh, what, yeah. you, what you saw this week also from Google with their rollout of the new Gemini Live and some new capabilities, they said, you know what, we're not going to roll it out in the EU region, right? Because they don't want mm -hmm. it to be um, in violation of some of the, the rules that are um, now in place in the EU. And so right. there, there are real world consequences to re regulation that may affect the um, economic long-term um, impact that AI will have in certain countries. Yeah. And of course, there is no right or wrong answer today, but it's important that we're having these conversations. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a context here that we can use, and it's probably a, a parallel that a lot of people don't really think about. The, the fact that AI uh, is available to so many has way more influence on just the economics or the business models or the consumer behaviors mm. and things like that. This is a national threat. This is a specific and very real national threat. Uh, I mean, I just started reading a book called Unit X. This is a book about how the government and Silicon Valley have been trying to organize themselves to better share information so that they can actually understand what these things are in terms of the military threats. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting because what's fundamentally changed, and I'll give you a physical example, just if, if AI is too 
conceptual or too abstract for your brain uh, to understand as a threat. We give you a specific example. During the, U- the Ukrainian war, uh, war, when that started, one of the things that the U.S. was able to do was to ship over a bunch of these new, uh, what of the latest generation of Abrams tanks um, have been shipped over there. I can't be- I remember exactly the number, but I think there were kind of like 90 tanks that were shipped over. We also saw images uh, last week of German tanks uh, actually heading toward Kursk, which was also kind of like a, a mind-blowing image, considering that they had done that during the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> and what's really interesting about that is that small drones that cost no more than $1,000 uh, were able to take out these Abrams tanks, right? So if you are putting a multi-million dollar tank on the ground and you know that somebody with an iPhone and a drone can take it out, you are uh, dealing with a, a paradigm that is completely yeah. uh, new and unusual. So uh, there's big questions like, hey, well, you know, where does funding go? Like if we're not going to be building tanks and aircraft carriers, where are we going to put the money? Um, and it's not really a case of either or. It's a case of, well, what do we do and what else do we do? And one of the considerations here as it relates to AI is that these drones are AI managed, right? Mm-hmm. They are, it's essentially a software war. Yep. Uh, the drone um, is the kind of economic efficiency in action mm-hmm. and the AI is the intelligence in action. And so what do, what do we, like, why is this important for the conversation we're having? It's seriously important because if you don't think AI is a significant national threat and that governments, both local and federal, should be involved, then you don't really understand the technology. And this goes back to our AI literacy conversation. You cannot just assume that this is a technology like yep. social media. Yep. You cannot assume that this is a technology just like um, you know crypto. This is very, very significant. This yep. is literally making decisions on behalf of people. These drones, these, uh, there's, new, uh, there's a new hypersonic rocket that's uh, a missile that's being developed mm-hmm. that flies faster than anything that's ever flown before and also doesn't fly in a parabolic arc like most intercontinentals or missiles do. So there's no way to actually figure out where it's going to go. It just figures itself out. It goes on any route, any path that it thinks is the best path for it to get to the destination. And so shooting these things out of the sky is incredibly difficult. Yeah. That doesn't scare the crap out of you. I'm not sure what will. So it's really important to understand that this is a software universe that we are living in. And these tools, whether they be commercial or warfare tools, they are driven by AI. And so it's really important for government at all levels, all kinds of regulators to get involved. Because if we allow self-regulation to happen, it will happen too late. And we'll be on you know, the wrong end of that conversation. Um, it's also interesting to note that the, the US is the leader in AI. And so we do have a current advantage. Mm-hmm. We have a maybe a temporary advantage over the rest of the world for us to both understand what this technology can do, and test it and get it out in the field, mm-hmm. find out just what it is that it's doing before we find out too late when one of our adversaries sends us a reminder. Yeah, uh, I mean, Talk about just chilling, listening to you, t- listening to you just um, articulate that, Richard. So there, there are two things I'm going to point listeners to right now. The first is if you go to imaginative.com, just search for military and defense. There's a tag for military and defense. And mm-hmm. to the point of, that Richard uh, mentioned, you'll see stories about companies like um, Andril and their lattice network for mission autonomy that mm-hmm. basically will allow um, drones to fly themselves in coordination with other um, weapon systems. There's a lot that is going to be happening with AI and autonomy um, that's happening now and that will keep on increasing over the, the coming months and years. But the second thing is if you're subscribed to the imaginative newsletter, in the newsletter we send out additional resources of content that we're consuming across the web content that we're creating um, that we think is important for the discourse. And so I would highly encourage you to to subscribe. One of the pieces that I'm going to be linking to this week is an article by um, 
Leopold Aschenbrenner, and he was a former open AI um, director of um, safety and alignment, and he recently left the company, but he wrote a 50,000 word article called Situational Awareness, The Decade Ahead. Mm -hmm. And when you read that and you kind of just get this glimpse as to where open AI is in terms of the technology, um, where we are in terms of scaling laws and what's coming, you realize mm -hmm. that we need to act very quickly. Um, they, they touch on yeah. some of the, the things that you mentioned, um, Richard, in, in, um, in the monologue just now, but it, it's so important that we move forward informed and as a society making the decisions collectively to say, okay, even if we make a decision that we don't agree with, at least we had a discussion about it. But what we don't want is to accidentally come up against too many of these issues um, before we have thought about them. And we, we, have, we have seen where there are considerations within social media that we, we didn't think deep enough, we didn't think wide enough, we didn't think long enough about um, the impact of social media. And we can't afford right. to do that with AI. Um, we have yeah. that opportunity and we have a window now where we can influence decisions, where we can influence the development of the technology. Um, we, we need to really um, get ahead of that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about um, literacy itself, because you know it's it's fine for us to throw up the flare and 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 create you know some anxiety by talking about these things. But what does somebody do with it? Um, you specifically and we have been working on a framework for thinking about this, and even the framework that you've created, Usage, which is an acronym. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, that is also something that's evolving. One of the things that you've mentioned is that it would be really interesting to be able to either self-assess or mm -hmm. assess people's maturity levels in terms of their um, AI literacy. You know, do they understand this? Uh, there is a, a current model out there, which um, I can't remember. I, I will, we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes. But the, the um, the model essentially looks at these four stages of learning. Mm -hmm. First stage is you just don't know what you don't know, right? We call that unconscious incompetence. So this is like, uh, I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of living in this like blissful ignorance. <laughs> it's great. You know, I didn't even know what AI is. That's <laughs> fine, you know. Um, and then your awareness starts to build. Maybe you're watching a podcast like this or listening to a podcast and suddenly you go like, wait, what? wait, do I need to worry about this stuff? Yep. This sounds really important. This is when you kind of get into that high anxiety state of like, I know what I don't know, or at least I'm aware that I, I should be knowing stuff. This is when you become conscious of your incompetence. Mm -hmm. um, then you move to the next stage where you start to learn things. You start to understand what it is that's going on. It's still a bit of a, an effort, right? We're not, you're not quite there yet. You're still struggling. And I think we're all in that stage. Yeah. I just like anybody who's out there, you're probably never going to leave this stage because this market is moving so quickly and these the technologies are moving so quickly. And that is when you're consciously competent. You can navigate around these things. You understand what the terms mean. You're capable of engaging in conversations where you can make decisions or clear decisions about what it is that needs to be acted on and what needs to be ignored. And then finally, you get to this final stage, which is called unconscious competence. And that's kind of like when you're driving your car, if you've been driving a car for many years, you get from A to B without even thinking about yeah. it. You might even get to your destination and not even remember any part of the drive. Yeah. And that's um, both an exciting stage to get to, but also an unusual stage because very often we get there and then we become very entrenched in our ways and maybe a little bit more conservative about how we change our minds. And so it can be both mm. interesting um, in terms of awareness or yeah. uh, your kind of subconsciousness, but it's also a stage at which you then need to re-enter that thing. So those are not just linear, those stages, but maybe circular in a way that you then need to ask the harder questions and go back to the beginning and say, well, what is it that I don't know? What is that I'm un unaware of? And that's really part of our job as AI literacy people is to talk a little, is talk about the things that you don't know, right? It's like these, these military threats, bring those to your attention. Uh, but then also provide some on ramp as to how you and your organization might think about this stuff. So let's just talk a little bit about usage and then let's talk, we'll take that and then let's talk about how we might even understand what maturity looks like and how we might organize around that. Sure. Uh, 
thank you for, for just kind of walking through that, Richard, because I, I think it's important for listeners to appreciate that what we're doing is based on just decades of experience thinking through strategy, helping companies build products and experiences that succeed, that help them to, to hit their business goals. And uh, when you see how companies are approaching AI, there is sometimes a lot of fear. Um, sometimes there's a lot of conversation around, hey, let's use ChatGPT, let's use a prompt and, mm -hmm. and do this. But that's not a very strategic approach. And you need to think longer if you're going to be right. building a business that you want to sustain, especially in an environment that's changing this quickly. And so what we're doing as we navigate the waters, we're identifying the tools and the resources that we think are going to be absolutely great for companies and for businesses um, to move faster, to move further. And so we, we started with the AI adoption framework. If you're a company, mm -hmm. if you're a business out there and you're thinking, hey, I want to adopt an AI initiative within our organization, um, or you're just thinking of where should I get started? How should I be thinking about the place of AI, where we are as a company, etc.? the usage framework is going to be great for you. And it goes over some of the mechanics as to what you need to do. It's an acronym yep. for you, understand, S, survey, A, align, G, guide, and E, evaluate. And uh, mm -hmm. last week we spoke a little bit about just understanding and how investing in structured learning programs and dedicated time for your teams will allow you to move faster and further and also leading by example, you yourself as a leader investing in learning and not necessarily knowing, needing to know the how, how um, the, the models work, um, how you need to prompt, etc. But knowing what you need to prompt, um, what you need the AI to do, what you need the AI to accomplish to move your business further. And so it, there, there are yeah. two just different layers of thinking. And this is going to be for leaders that are thinking more at, at that um, top level business strategy focus to say, okay, um, how do we implement this in a way where um, you will have impact within um, your, your right. business bottom line? One of the things that you and I bring to this conversation um, and why we think that these you know, retreats and these leadership events and the workshops that we're currently doing are so important is that this is not just a case of understanding the technology and having a framework to think about it, but it's actually implementing that stuff. Yep. Now, you and I have spent our entire adult lives building applications. And, and one of the serious considerations around this is that there is a dark web version of design, right? This is, yes. you know, it's often called, you know, shadow design or dark, dark patterns. patterns. There's lots of, yeah, there's yeah. lots of ways to describe this, but, um, you know, if you found yourself maybe going to a, uh, a McDonald's recently and going to one of those kiosks, you'll have discovered that you are spending about 15 to 20 cent, 20 percent more on your purchase these days. And the reason is, is because they're using software and UX to do that. Um, you as a as a sentient being will obviously, you know, like to would like to believe that you are in control of your thoughts, you're in control of your actions, yep. in control of your decisions. As AI makes user experience and these user interfaces even better at tricking you, you are going to find yourself in sequences of behavior that are surprising to you. Yep. You will literally not be able to understand why you are thinking the way you're thinking. Now, if McDonald's can trick you into <laughs> buying more expensive items with a kiosk, just imagine what a political campaign using AI can do into tricking you to participate in a certain kind of voting pattern or, you know, showing up in a certain way um, or thinking a certain way. Yeah. So again, I don't want to sound like the doom and gloom guy here. I'm actually, a, you know, I'm a tech optimist in general. Um, I think these things have really amazing uh, applications, but this usage model is really important because what it does is it objectifies a lot of these choices these decisions and it allows you to step back and say what is actually going on here instead of just participating in the madness can i actually think about what is going to be happening to me my team my family whatever it is the the, the context is one of the things we talked about uh, is do you have the capability or do we have the capability to allow teams to assess themselves 
Now, this is a particularly hard thing to do. Yeah. You can assess yourself, of course, but I've worked on probably the largest design assessment tool ever created uh, when I was working for a company called InVision. We surveyed 2,700 companies. And I'll give you some of the things that we need to think about as we think about maturity, because if people are listening to this and thinking about how do we assess our team? How do we figure out whether we're there or not? Are we low maturity, high maturity? Are we yep. kind of at that in, you know, unconscious incompetence <laughs> stage or are we further along? A um, couple of things to consider. Now, there are self-assessments out there, but just like any self-assessment, these can fall into the uh, astrology category in the sense of like, well, it, it kind of, it feels good, but it might not actually be very accurate. And, yep. you know, you are, you know, a sample of one. So is the data really that good? As you broaden your data set, in other words, if you're able to look at not just yourself as a as a uh, input, but as all of the people in your organization, that can get better. However, there's still no benchmarking. There's still no way for you to say, well, am I better against what? You know, what is the comparison? And so it's important that any kind of maturity model also is represented by a benchmark, and that benchmark can be best generated through a significant data set. So the more companies, the more individuals that you are able to survey, uh, the larger the data set from each survey response. In other words, can you get multiple responses and asks this? Really what you're doing is asking the same question in different ways so you yeah. can you know, um, keep your, your data in, a, in great hygiene. Um, then you can actually build a set of benchmark data and then you can say, okay, great. We allowed you to assess yourself. Now we're going to pass that over to the data set that is a benchmark and then we can start to see what um you know what the differences are what the probabilities that you're going to get there um, and all those kinds of other fancy tricks that, that statistics can do now in the past that was actually a big big task uh when this work was first started by um Leah beauty and Aaron walter many many years ago it was actually very difficult they would quite literally have to go to every single company that, that the Envision worked with. In fact, beyond just the companies that we worked with, but any company that was using design or had a design team. And, um, and what they found that it was just really laborious to go and collect yeah. all this data. Yeah. Uh, we now have different tools at our disposal. Um, the other thing that Imaginative has is we have a very, very large subscriber base. We have yep. a lot of people that subscribe to our newsletter. And so what we're probably going to start doing is thinking about how we can use our fans and our, our, our followers, our subscribers, to help us think about what this maturity model could look like. Um, we're going to probably be sending out a survey to establish some kind of benchmark, and then we're going to build on top of that to establish what it might look like for the individual who wants to assess themselves or the team that wants to assess themselves. Exactly. I'll add one more thing. And this is a really, really important point. When we were able to survey leaders in organizations, they consistently, and when I say consistently, I'm saying all of them, yeah. <laughs> assess themselves as being more mature than they thought they, than they, they actually were. Yeah. So uh, the way that we did this, we'd assess the leader, and then let's say a VP of design, and then we'd assess the design team and the design team was always at a lower maturity or at least assessed themselves at a lower maturity. And there's an honesty in that, right? The whole group was saying, look, we're pretty sure we're not there yet. We, there's still a lot of work to do. For instance, like if we're building a design system or they're doing some kind of data analysis yeah. uh, or analytics on their, on their uh, UX and UI uh, work, they were saying, look, we're just not sure we really have an answer here. Where the leader was very optimistic, overly optimistic. <laughs> And so, so one of the things that we will be making sure we do, and we also encourage people to think about is don't just go and interview your leaders. Don't just ask them for their opinions, but think a little bit about what it is that's happening on the ground and assess those people, get the, get the engineers, the developers, the designers, the marketers to tell you what's happening, you know, what's actually going on in your business. What is AI doing in your organization? Um, and how are you using it? Is it just, we have access to chat GPT, which we've heard from a ton of people yeah. like every time he's like, Hey, you're a, you're a, you know, fortune 500 company. Tell us more about your chat GPT, I mean, about your AI approach. And they were like, well, we have access to chat GPT. Yeah. That's their answer. 
And yeah. so we need, we obviously need better answers than that um, if we're going to start to see these things as practical opportunities to improve, you know, the company's performance. Love that. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be a resource that companies will be able to get a lot of value out of, um, even in terms of designing programs internally for um, mm -hmm. recognition, for um, just growing within the organization. I, I think this is going to be a key benchmark that uh, we want companies to be able to um, trust and to rely on um, as a part of their strategy. All right. So yeah. Richard, we, we are going to wrap up now, and there's one yeah. last story that I, I just kind of want to touch on because I would be remiss if we ended the week without talking about some new product updates that came out mm. of Google and out of Midjourney because this was a big week for Google. This, even though we, we probably didn't um, realize because of some mishaps, but it was a big week. They announced some new Pixel devices that look incredible. Mm -hmm. These are some of the best yep. smartphones and um, personal computing devices that I've seen. And uh, they also announced um, new AI models and things like uh, search generative overviews that they're rolling out now. Mm -hmm. And so, we're starting to see more consumer products, as you mentioned, come to market um, from the big tech giants like Google. And a couple of things struck me that I'm just going to kind of um, talk about uh, without uh, much context. Uh, but you can read the stories on Imaginative. Uh, we're going to link to some reviews of some of the, the Pixel devices in the newsletter. So if you're interested in looking at what personal computing um, will likely evolve um, into over the coming months, um, those will be super helpful. But a couple of things happened. One, at their event, they were doing live demos and they were mm -hmm. showing their AI in real time and it failed on three or four mm. occasions <laughs> in real time. And, and so like, I, I also appreciate that that's why companies haven't been doing live demos. I love the fact that they were able to show the failures and people were able to see that um, it's not perfect. The technology may not be, be there yet. When you saw the latency sometimes um, when it needed to send the command up to the cloud and then come back to your device, um, it, it's important for us to be aware of um, the expectations we need to set and have as mm -hmm. we were thinking about um, where the technology is today. No, this will quickly change. Yep. But as you were seeing it in real life, you, you look back and you think of the rabbits and the human AI pins and you were like, we were nowhere close to this six months ago, right? Um, <laughs> and then- uh, Those they, even seem like kind of humorous. I know, context. right? It's like, yeah, when you think back on it. Um, and, but Gemini Live still as a technology was really impressive. Just seeing the future of um, personal assistance that will go beyond just typical voice commands. I think mm -hmm. that's really cool. But off note, you will need to pay $20 per month to have this uh, technology on your right. phone. And so I'm very curious because I've argued a lot that the business use case for consumer AI just isn't there yet. Of course, you have things like image generation for uh, a couple of things and then maybe helping you to write things. But again, these technologies cost a whole lot to develop. And so for a company yes. that is spending a lot to, to develop a personal Not just a whole lot to develop, model, but actually to maintain as well. And very, to maintain, very yeah, that's, that's very true. Yeah. Um, how do you actually monetize this with consumers? And so Google decided that, hey, you know what, to use this, you're going to need to pay $20 per month. And so I'd be curious mm -hmm. to just see how many people end up paying $20 um, subscription to get this on their phone. Um, or if Google will open it up to the user choosing the AI provider that they want, where um, you can yeah. say, hey, I don't want Gemini, I want to use GPT or um, an open source model. Um, you're, you're also- Well, if they seeing... haven't learned their lesson from the last antitrust conversation, <laughs> they forget <laughs> <can't> to. <laughs> yeah. Um... And just on this point, I think, you know, um, you know, just to make it all about us, because, you know, I, I love talking about how smart we are. <laughs> but we've actually suggested this, we, you know, in multiple cases um, that we've had these conversations, we've been able to say, hey, we are seeing the companies that have an installed base, who have subscribers already on a device mm -hmm. or in an application. Those are the ones that are going to win because they can insert this new set of features and say, hey, look, for just a little bit more. Your, exactly your experience can be improved dramatically. And I think if somebody's already paying two or three hundred dollars a month for a smartphone for their subscriptions and all this stuff, what's another twenty dollars? We'll find out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not entirely sure whether they'll have everybody jump on board, but I certainly think that 
um, you know, if if what's happened with ChatGPT, I mean, there's a subscription base there in without even an installed base, without even in like a device, without even like a platform uh, to support it. So mm. I'm feeling, feeling optimistic that Google's on the right track here. Yeah. And then the, the other story I'll highlight is from MidJourney. Now, we spoke a lot about uh, this chatbot user experience that everybody was jumping on six uh, months ago and we were saying, hey, hold your horses. Um, mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. UI does need to be a chatbot. And uh, MidJourney, of course, was born as a Discord bot. So you needed to use right. Discord. We ran into issues where companies, big, uh, massive OEMs would come to us and they're like, hey, we want to use MidJourney. And as we walked them through the process, they realized that no, there was no way this was going to be allowed on their internal um, networks for security reasons. And uh, yeah. this week you saw MidJourney uh, release their editor in their browser. And they, they have been making this steady march towards moving away from Discord and building mm -hmm. their own product in the web and so in, in mm -hmm. on, on a web browser experience and so this is exciting i think for anybody that um, has struggled to use mid journey within discord over the the last um year they're going to be encouraged to see that no you're able to go to the mid journey website you're able to use the new editor which feels so intuitive and fluid you, you can just expand the canvas in whatever direction um highlight areas yep. of uh, the image that you want to change and it, it's 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 fluid from a workflow standpoint as a designer it feels like it was created for a designer versus um, somebody just chatting and then trying to shoehorn design tools where you needed to learn all these commands. I was yeah. I was um, showing somebody mid-journey the other day and they were like, what are all these things that you're writing? Because there were all of these shortcut commands that you need to do for aspect ratios and for um, generating repeats and, and all these features of the yeah. model because there was no UI to do it. So you needed to know this as a, almost like a right. programming language to be able to use it effectively. Yep. And now you'll, you'll, you'll be able to use that with a user interface, a, a, a GUI, a graphical user interface um, that is going to be super easy. So kudos to, yeah, to Mid Journey for um, kind of maturing um, with their product like that. Um, I'm excited mm -hmm. to see Very the good. adoption for that and, and, and where people take it. And, and again, this is uh, something we've talked about mm -hmm. before, the conversational AI is really what we're talking about here. This is whether you like it or not, the anthropomorphication of technology allows human beings to use it. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, there is the kind of the academic point of view that says, well, don't anthropomorphize things that are technologies. Well, they are already, they're <laughs> designed by humans, they're made for humans, and they're used by humans. And so, you know, when you're prompting, you're having a conversation. Right. That's what you're doing. You're asking it questions. You're asking it to do things for you as if you were asking an assistant that was literally sitting next to you or pairing that you were sitting, you know, you a designer or developer, you were pairing together to do work. And so this is no different. I think that's really important because there's that generation of kids that are coming up. Yep. I know you've got kids that probably do that. They either talking to Alexa or the Google or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they're just like having these conversations on a daily basis as if those, those things, those as objects to us, they feel like objects, but to them, they're part of the family. These are yeah. people who they have regular conversations with. <laughs> and so extent, by extension, whether you're having a conversation out loud or whether you're having a conversation, you know, in words, or ultimately when we have the neural link, when we're having conversations in our heads, these are the anthropomorphic things that we have to consider. And I'll go back to what I said in the past. I've written about this a thousand times. I've been on stage talking about this is that the best designer for the future that we're heading into is a biologist or an evolutionist, somebody who understands how people behave. They're irrational, they're a little bit insane sometimes, and you need to understand some of these things to make these products really, really sick. <laughs> Richard, love that. Um, I, I, I think that's going to be a conversation for another day because there are so many things that I, I want to, to push you on and to, to dive deeper into. But I'll, I'll end with a personal story that I, I think is hilarious. I hope um, the, the listeners find it funny too. But my kids, they're six and uh, four, and they mm -hmm. use Siri, they use um, different personal assistants all the time, right? To ask general questions, to um, sometimes play music in the car, control devices, etc. right? But I realized the other day that they think that the assistant's name is Hey Siri. 
they they so <laughs> <laughs> all this time they didn't realize that uh, I was just saying hey as a trigger Two word. Words. They just thought that was the, the, the name of the assistant. And so they would be like, hey, can we ask a Siri um, X, Y, Z? And I'm like, ah, that's so hilarious. Because to your Interesting. point, Interesting. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just natural for them, right? They're AI native. Yeah. And they're growing up with this technology. And it's going to be embedded all around them. So lots to think about. But listen, folks, um, thank you for joining us for another week. We have a lot of fun talking about um, just the stories that are most important, covering them with you, but also going beyond just the headlines and talking about why it's important for you to pay attention to some stories. Um, we, we talk about the repercussions of certain decisions and um, hopefully we try to um, encourage discourse around the topics that matter. And so we have so many more experiences that we'll want to share with you over the, the coming weeks and months, um, in-person events, as Richard mentioned, new tools and resources that we're going to be putting out um, for business leaders and companies that are looking to increase their AI maturity, to measure it, to assess it, to level up their, their workforce. Um, so stay tuned, subscribe if you haven't already to Imaginative um, to our newsletter. And we have a paid subscription also, which is fantastic. If you just want to dive a little bit deeper um, and you get access to some early resources that um, are coming up and of course if you're on youtube give this video a thumbs up um, leave a comment below it really helps plus we love hearing from you but um, richard any last words before we wrap up uh, i mean obviously really excited about both the events <laughs> some some work we've got with customers which we'll talk about in the future and then of course one of the things that we that we just mentioned in this thing is the maturity model uh, very, very early stages, but really excited about how that might develop. Ah, awesome. Oh, one last thing. Um, before I forget, uh, this week we published a video with LinkedIn. Um, we worked with LinkedIn over the last um, couple of weeks to do an interview that expands the mechanics that we cover in the Usage AI Adoption Framework course. And I go into detail, just kind of talking about um, practical tips and um, how you want to be thinking about um, implementing usage within your organization. So it's a free course. It's available only on LinkedIn. If you go to my profile or Richard's profile, you'll see links to it. But it's a great conversation with Ashley from um, the LinkedIn learning team. We just kind of casually talk about um, things that we have done personally within um, our business, things that we recommend and um, just roadblocks that you may want to navigate. So um, again, lots of resources coming out. If you're subscribed, you're going to get links to all of them. Um, so check it out. Hopefully you enjoy it. But until next week, one love.